Hi, I'm Kamarai. Since I started this channel, I think the question I get asked the most is how? How do I know how to do the things I do with geometry nodes? And honestly, some of the time, I don't. It's not often that I sit down with a complete blueprint for a setup in my head. Though after working with it as much as I have, it does happen sometimes. When I first started out, most of my work came down to trial and error. And along the way, I gained some key insights which helped me learn faster and ultimately gave me a deeper understanding of how to use the tools that the Geometry Notes provide. So I figured I would share some of those insights with you today. So grab a coffee or something, sit back, and get ready to absorb some knowledge that hopefully will help you with demystifying the Geometry Notes workflow. Here we go. Insight number one. Compartmentalize. One of the most important things to understand about the Geometry Notes workflow is that it's a very stepwise process. What I mean by that is that each part of what you make is constructed step by step. And because of that, you should think about each part as a separate thing that you built from the ground up, and then combined with the rest of the setup. Let me give you an example. Here is a mesh that I made with geometry nodes. At first glance, it might be difficult to even know where to start if you wanted to recreate it. But if you look at each individual part of a mesh as a separate thing, you will have a much easier time deducing what is going on. And from there you can break down each of those parts into smaller components. Looking at the stem, it's just made of a distorted curve that is then turned into a mesh. And the same is true for the branches, which are curves that have been instantiated on the original stem curve. And lastly, the leaves are just a curve that has been turned into a mesh to look like a leaf, and then instantiated on the branch curves. Let's look at a simpler example, and think about how we can compartmentalize the parts. Here we have a bunch of cubes spread out on a deformed plane with the size of the cubes being determined by their distance from the center. Looking at the nodes, we can compartmentalize the main steps of the setup. The first step are these four nodes, which are used to create the deformed plane. The second step consists of these two nodes, used to instantiate the cubes on the deformed plane. Step 3 are these two nodes which aligns the cubes with the faces of the mesh. Step 4 handles the scaling of the cubes by taking the cube positions and getting their distances from the center and using those values to set the scales. And the final step is this join geometry node, which combines everything before outputting it as a mesh. My point with all of this is that thinking about the mesh in terms of smaller parts of a whole is an important skill to have when working with geometry nodes, and the more you do it, the easier it gets. Insight number 2. Modeling in edit mode. Geometry nodes might be a separate system from edit mode in Blender, but in order to use the nodes effectively, you should know how to actually model things. Because even though the workflow is like night and day, the underlying principles are essentially the same. Let's look at an example. If I were to model this mesh in the usual way, I would first insert the faces, extrude them, and finally scale them. A pretty simple order of operations. So how could the same mesh be made with geometry nodes? Well, using the same cube as a base, first I would insert the faces with this extrude and scale combo, Then I would extrude the faces, and finally scale them. The logical flow of operations remains basically the same, with the main difference being the execution. The nodes in this case have pretty self-explanatory names. The tricky part of this setup would be the inset operation, since there isn't actually an inset node, at least not in Blender 3.3 which I'm using. But with some logical thinking, you could come to the conclusion that insetting a face is essentially the same as extruding it and scaling it towards the center of the face. Situations like this where you are missing a node to do a specific thing is pretty common when working with geometry nodes, 
So being able to think about what you want to do in a step-by-step -step manner, similar to how you would do it in edit mode, would usually lead you to find a solution. Another way to help you figure out how to approach the creation of something with jumped notes is to actually model the thing you want to create the usual way first, and then use that as a reference. Now you might be thinking, why would I do it with jumped notes if I have already done it the usual way? And that's a valid point. However, one thing that meshes made with jumped notes can do that regular meshes can't, is create variants. Take this mesh I made for a video a while back for example. It consists of a bunch of cubes with some subsurf and some extrusions to create these dents. This could be recreated the usual way fairly easily of course, but what if I want the number of cubes to be higher and the configuration different? With a regular mesh, this would not be very easy and would likely take a lot of time and effort. But with geometry nodes, I just have to change some values in the node tree to get a new variant, so the time that I spent making the setup could save me an immense amount of time in the long run. Insight number 3. Understand vectors. Since Blender is a 3D software, having at least a basic understanding of what vectors are is usually a good idea, especially when working with geometry nodes. A 3D vector holds three values that are usually named after the x, y, and z axis. And in geometry nodes, you will often encounter situations where you will need to use vectors in one way or another. For example, let's say you want to move all the vertices of this cube, which are located above the origin point of the scene. How would you do that? Considering that the origin point has a position vector which is zero on both the x, y, and z axis, we could say that any vertex with a position vector with a z value that is greater than zero should be moved. In practice, it will be achieved like this. Vectors can also be used to describe directions, for example in the case of face normals. The normal vector of a face is constructed just like a position vector, however the vector values now describe a direction in 3D space, pointing directly outward from the face, irrespective of the position of that face. So why is this so important in regards to geometry nodes? Well, whenever you want to move things, you will need to use vectors in one way or another. A good example is when using the set position node. The set position node has both a position input and an offset input, with the latter giving you the ability to set the vector values directly in the node. Any vector that you plug into the position input will overwrite the position stored in the mesh with the new vector values, while any vector plugged into the offset input will add to the existing position vectors of the mesh. So for example, by using the normal vector as the offset for this subdivided cube, we can see that the positions of the mesh now have their normal vectors added on top of their original positions. If we instead plug the normal vectors into the position input, the original positions will be overwritten, with the normal vectors values instead. Vectors are a pretty big topic on their own, so if you want to learn more about what they are, I suggest checking out this video by Floaty Monkey. Insight number 4. Theorize. The first tutorial I posted on this channel was a short video on how to create fractals with geometry nodes, and at that time I knew almost nothing about the system. I do however think that the process leading up to the creation of that video laid the foundation for my rapid progression afterwards. The idea for the fractal setup came when I watched this video by Antagma, specifically the part where they instantiated cubes on points. Before I tried making the fractal setup, I theorized that if I instantiate a mesh on the vertices of another mesh, I could repeat that process with the vertices of the instantiated mesh as well. Now this turned out to be the case, which meant that my hypothesis was correct, and as a result, I gained a greater insight into how Yomt nodes works. More specifically that points and vertices can both be used to instantiate things, and that the instantiated geometry can be used like any other geometry. 
But let's say that it wasn't true, and that I was completely wrong. Well, if that was the case, I would still gain a greater insight into how the system works, because now I would know that the thing I was trying to do was not possible, or at least not possible in the way that I theorized. And by knowing that, I could for example rethink my hypothesis and make new assumptions as to why I was wrong, and in the process learn even more. As mundane as this insight might sound, it's something I never stop doing, and it still helps me today when I face problems I haven't encountered before. Of course this might be something that is highly individual, but I wanted to include it anyway in case someone else finds it useful. And finally, insight number 5, embrace failure. If there is one thing you should take away from this video is that you should never be afraid of failure, especially when it comes to learning. Whenever you fail at something, you can handle it in two main ways. Either you fail and never try again, or you fail, reflect on why you failed, and then try again. Doing the latter allows you to adjust your approach towards a problem in a way that will increase your chances at success. This is true for basically anything, whether it be learning to play an instrument, playing sports, learning to dance or sing, learning maths, and so on. It's okay to fail, and if you embrace that mindset, there is nothing stopping you from improving yourself. The only thing stopping you is you. And when it comes to failing with jump notes, the worst thing that can happen is that you have to try again, and even then you might learn something in the process. See you next time.